Yes, we're live. Good afternoon. I'm Chair Kite, and I would like to welcome you to the December 9th, 2020 Historic Resources Commission meeting. The HRC is a quasi-judicial body that is governed by North Carolina General Statutes, the City of Asheville's Unified Development Ordinance, and Buncombe County Ordinance. We are authorized to hear requests for certificates of appropriateness for alterations, demolitions, new construction, and other work within historic districts, or for the alteration and demolition of historic landmarks and other duties, including pre preliminary review of subdivisions as specified in the ordinance for the HRC. All commissioners and staff are participating virtually. We appreciate, appreciate your patience as we work through commission meetings a bit differently than normal. We are streaming live on the city's virtual engagement hub, which is accessible through the virtual engagement hub link on the front page of the city's website, as well as through the link on the HRC webpage. We also have an option for the public to listen live by phone by dialing 855-925-2801 and entering code 9384. Welcome to all of you that are joining us today. I will now ask the commission members who are participating to introduce ourselves. Uh, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to James Komen. This is, uh, he is a new, uh, newly appointed commissioner and this is uh, his first meeting today. So welcome James. Um, please make sure commissioners that you mute your microphone if you're not speaking. And when you have a question or would like to speak, you can unmute your microphone and please remember to remute uh, yourself after you're done speaking. Commission members, as I call your name, please say a quick hello. Vice Chair Eakins. Hi. Uh, Commissioner Brusades. Hi. Commissioner Coleman. Hi. Commissioner Gardner. Hello. Commissioner Hornaday. Hi. Commissioner Mitchell. Good evening. Commissioner Spring. Hello. Commissioner Watson. Hello. Commissioner West. Hello. And Commissioner Vaughn. Hello. To help our audience follow along, I will state each section of the agenda aloud and will ask for a vocal roll call vote for each of our votes. Uh, first item on the agenda is to adopt the minutes from our previous uh, meeting. We will consider the meeting minutes from the November 2020 meeting of the HRC. The minutes include findings of fact and conclusions of law for certificates of appropriateness. Are there any corrections? I move that we approve the minutes and findings of fact and conclusions of law for the November 20, 2020 HRC meeting. Second. Okay, that was a motion by Vice Chair Eakins and a second by Commissioner Watson. I will um, roll call vote. Vice Chair Eakins? Aye. Commissioner Brusades? Aye. Commissioner Coleman. Aye. Commissioner Gardner. Aye. Commissioner Hornaday. Aye. Commissioner Mitchell. I'm going to abstain from the connectivity issues during that meeting. Commissioner Spring. Aye. Commissioner Watson. Aye. Commissioner West. Aye. Commissioner Vaughn. Aye. Okay, that motion carries. We are now uh, ready to begin the evidentiary hearings uh, for the items listed on the agenda. Um, as a quasi-judicial proceeding, the HRC is not setting policy, nor are we soliciting public opinion on the desirability of an application. The HRC hears and considers evidence presented and applies the standards set forth in the guidelines and standards of the specific historic district for that application. 
the HRC must make its decision upon competent material and substantial evidence to determine the facts of the hearing. The HRC will use judgment and discretion to apply the standards contained in the relevant guidelines to the facts. The commissioners in voting for an item will not have a fixed opinion that is not susceptible to change, will not have a conflict of interest, and will not have engaged in ex parte communication uh, regarding the application. The rules for speaking, this meeting is open to the public, but participation is limited to interest, interested parties who wish to provide or comment, uh, provide comment or testimony regarding the proposal. If you will be speaking as a witness, please focus on the facts of how they relate to the relevant historic district standards and guidelines, not personal preference or opinion. Witnesses must swear or affirm their testimony. At this time, I will administer the oath for all individuals who intend to provide witness testimony. Uh, Chair Kite, so it's just myself and the applicant, Maggie Be Bevilacqua, that are, need to be sworn in today. Okay. Uh, you can both, um, I will read the oath to both of you and then I will um, call your names individually to affirm. Uh, do you solemnly swear or affirm that the information you present during the hearing for a certificate of appropriateness before the Historic Resources Commission shall be the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Alex? I do. And Maggie? I do. Okay. Uh, we will move to our first public hearing item. I think that is old business at 122 West Chestnut Street, which I think we need to continue to January. Correct. Okay. I move we continue 120 to West Chestnut Street to the January meeting. Second. I'm sorry, who was who seconded? Second. Okay, thank, thank you. Okay. Uh, we'll vote by roll call. Vice Chair Eakins? Aye. Commissioner Bersades? Aye. Commissioner Coleman? Aye. Commissioner Gardner? Aye. Commissioner Hornaday? Aye. Commissioner Mitchell? Aye. Commissioner Spring? Aye. Commissioner Watson? Aye. Commissioner West? Aye. And Commissioner Vaughn? Aye. Okay. The next item. I'm on sorry, Emily. This is Ashley. I'm going to have you pause for just one second. We're having a, the screen looks really weird on public input in YouTube. So let's get that straight so everybody can see the meeting. And I'll be right back with you and let you know when to continue. Okay.
Just an update, IT is coming up to um, City Hall to help us, so stand by. And Alex, I just sent you a slide. Can you please put that up so that'll show on public input? It just says, just share your screen like you if you were presenting and it says we're experiencing technical difficulties. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Hey, Shannon, can you hear me? Uh, yes. I'm going to go ahead and hold on. I, f I forgot I have YouTube open. I'm going to go ahead and YouTube. I'm going to go ahead and mute the conference bridge while um, IT is working on this. So I just want to let you know. Oh, OK. Thank you. Hey, Ashley, I don't know if there's anything you can do to manipulate the slide. I didn't want to mess with your thing, but when you open YouTube, you can't see the part that says we're having technical difficulties. You can only see the, the commission name and the date. Not yeah, that I, just I think it's that. the same. It's the same problem we're having with the with yeah. the live stream. So we're only getting a piece of the whole of the whole screen. Um, sure, I know. That's why I was just letting you know that if you want to like move the text around, I didn't want to alter your slide without. Yeah, you know, I'll go. I'll know. go ahead and move. We're experiencing te technical difficulty. Please stand by. I'll move that up so at least people see that. Okay. If cool. they get to the screen. Okay. okay. So. Thanks. I want to mute this. And thank you guys for your patience. We appreciate you. 
Um, you can talk. The phone line is muted now, so nobody can hear anything. And I'm gonna I'm gonna work on that slide really quick for you. And as soon as we know we're live, we'll let you guys know. Thank you. Thank you guys for being here. I realize I'm the only person on the agenda today. And so if it weren't for me, everybody would have a free afternoon. So I appreciate you being here and being patient. Thanks. Oh, you're sweet, Maggie. No worries. We're we're happy to be here with you. And we've got some other business stuff to talk about too. So don't feel like you're okay, you're our only yeah. reason. <laughs> no pressure. Alex, I changed it around. Let me know how that looks. It looks like maybe the live stream is getting resolved because I can see everything now on YouTube. Let me go ahead and confirm with Rick and Sarah. They're all on the fifth floor. So I think they're getting most of it right now, but I have the display that's 1920 by 1080. And that's what's reading. So I showing output 720, so maybe you can do the top and the bottom. So my in-stream change that to 1920 by 1080. All right, team, you are all set to go. Shannon, go ahead and unmute the conference bridge. All right, we're unmuted. We can begin with the meeting or restart the meeting. All right, we're unmuted. Wow, thank you. <laughs> next, uh, our next item on the agenda is um, 77 Magnolia Avenue in the Montford Historic District. Alex? Yes, ma'am. Give me just a second. Let me, I've got so many different things pulled up to try to figure out what we were working on here. Okay. Um, let's see. Let me go back to something a different tab. So I did not um, create a, sorry, let me go back and say, my name is Alex Cole. I'm a uh, historic preservation planner with the planning and urban design department. Um, the, the first item is uh, application for uh, this house on Magnolia uh, Avenue. Um, I did not create a separate presentation kind of slideshow like I have done the past several months since we only have this one item. Um, and it's a pretty simple project. So um, this is just some context showing the front and the um, the east elevation of the house where the um, property owner is just proposing to change a single window. Um, are, can you can you all see the um, the tab I'm presenting? Okay. Yes. Okay. Cool. Um, so the so the proposal is just to um, alter one window opening uh, on the back corner of the house. Um, you can see that the existing opening uh, or original window, if there if it was an original opening, the, the window is gone and um, and is had a, has already been modified. So the proposal is just to um, change that opening to a smaller awning window. Um, and it's a pretty straightforward request and it's on a non-character defining elevation and um, staff does not have any concerns, but happy to answer any questions if you all have any. Commissioners, any questions for Alex? This looks like a no brainer. Maggie, do you have anything else that you'd like to add to the information? Nope, that's it. Thank you. 
commissioners, any questions for the applicant? Okay, then we will open the floor for public comment. Madam Chair, uh, we do not have any callers. Okay. Then we will close the floor for public comment. Uh, commissioners, any additional discussion? I'm ready to make a motion. Okay. Chairman, based upon the evidence presented to this commission, including exhibit A, project description, exhibit B, photographs of subject property and renderings, three pages, and the commission's actual inspection and review of subject property by all members except. I move that this commission approve the certificate of appropriateness based on the following. One, that the application is to modify existing previously altered window opening on east elevation. Opening will be shortened and one new six light wood awning window will be installed Wood lap siding and trim surrounding window will be restored to match existing siding and trim. All work will be in accordance with attached drawings and plans. All permits, variances, or approvals as required by law must be obtained before work may commence. Two, that the standards for windows and doors found on pages 84 and 85 and materials wood on pages 66 and 67 of the Montford Historic District Design Standards adopted April 14, 2010 and amended December 11, 2019 were used to amend to evaluate this request. Three, this application does meet the design guidelines for the following reasons. A, new window will be wood and compatible with the overall design of the building. B, new window will be located within an existing previously altered opening. C, window opening being modified is on a non-character defining elevation. D, siding and trim will be restored to match existing original siding and trim. Four, that the action and improvements proposed in the application before us for a certificate of appropriateness are congruous with the special historic character of the Montford Historic District. Is there a second? Second. It was a second by Commissioner Watson. Uh, we will vote by roll call. Vice Chair Eakins? Aye. Commissioner Brusades? Aye. Commissioner Coleman? Aye. Commissioner Gardner? Aye. Commissioner Hornaday? Aye. Commissioner Mitchell? Aye. Commissioner Sprang? Aye. Commissioner Watson? Aye. Commissioner West? Aye. Commissioner Vaughn? Aye. Myself, aye as well. Okay, that motion having carried uh, based upon the following and foregoing findings and the reasons set forth therein, I move that a certificate of appropriateness be issued. Second. The second by Commissioner Watson. Uh, roll call vote, Vice Chair Eakins. Aye. Vice, uh, Commissioner Brusades. Aye. Commissioner Komen? Aye. Commissioner Gardner? Aye. Commissioner Hornaday? Aye. Commissioner Mitchell? Aye. Commissioner Sprang? Aye. Commissioner Watson? Aye. Commissioner West? Aye. Commissioner Vaughn? Aye. Myself, I as well. That motion also carries. I think Thank you, Maggie. Thank you, guys. Thanks for your time. 
that concludes, I believe, Alex, the um, applications for this on this agenda. Correct. Um, so now all we have is other business, which just has the one item that I messaged you all about earlier today um, to give some context to uh, the item about the Stanley Award discussion. Um, and I'll let Mr. Hornaday chime in here because he had um, more kind of firsthand conversation about this than I did. But so uh, this conversation was initiated in the spring between um, Mr. Hornaday and Andrea Clark um, when we were awarding her the um, Stanley Award during the um, our, our normal time of year when we award the, the um, but suddenly some questions came up around Stanley as a person and his history and um, potential as an out as being known as out, outwardly racist. So, um, so I, I also included in the document the the um, for some of our newer commissioners. There we have a document that lists all the people that have been awarded uh, the Stanley since 19. 88 and as well as like a description of of um, how the award is given um, and while we had like a really brief couple of sentences of, of Forrester Sonley um, in that document we did not have a fully a more fully fleshed out understanding of his um, history and character as a person so um, Catherine Cutshaw from um, Buckham County Special Collections is here with us today she um, graciously offered to help us and do has done some great research and there so there's a two page document in there as well for you all to read through that has some really helpful enlightening information I think um, about Sonley as a person and so um, today I think the goal is to open up discussion and hear thoughts um, on potentially changing the name of the Sonley award and then what I, and I'll let um, Chair Kite and you all kind of give direction on this, but what I was kind of thinking that might work best is if we kind of have general discussion today and then we take away kind of, you know, what information is shared and then we revisit this at the next meeting, um, you know, based on kind of the discussion today, you know, whether we want to, if, if you all feel like it's um, a, the right thing to rename it, then, you know, who should we consider re renaming it for? Should it be a person? You know, those are all things we, we should talk through. Um, so I, I'm interested to hear all of your thoughts and I will turn it over to um, Catherine if you want to introduce yourself and talk a little bit about what you found in your research. Sure, thanks, Alex. Um, like Alex said, my name is Catherine Calhoun Cutshaw. I'm the collections manager at what most of you probably know as the North Carolina Room. Um, in January, we're going to change to Buncombe County Special Collections um, because we're changing our collection scope just a little bit and um, refocusing on Buncombe County and Asheville and Western North Carolina. So um, be looking forward to that change and a lot of other really cool things going on in that space right now. Um, so, like Alex said, I wrote up a very brief, um, not particularly well cited document, but none of it is more than general information. Um, so, no su big surprises in there. Um, and I'll just tell you a little bit about who Sonley was and what Sonley's relationship to the library and history and heritage in Buncombe County is. Um, so Sonley, Foster Sonley, um, it's sometimes spelled Forster, um, but he mostly went by S.A. Sonley, and it's spelled Foster on his um, headstone. So, you know, um, take it for what you will. His grandparents were James Mitchell Alexander and Rhoda Cunningham Alexander. Um, they were some of the wealthiest and most influential people who settled Buncombe County. Um, they went on to build numerous hotels, and between 1800 and 1860, the Alexander family enslaved more than 80 people. Um, Foster was born in 1857 and thus was not an adult and did, never owned any slaves. 
Um, but he, that makes him a child of a particular generation. He was some of the, you know, that generation, some of the last children born during the era of enslavement. Um, and Sondley was certainly influenced by the environment where he grew up, which was at his grandmother's plantation called Montreala in Alexander. Um, and one of his works is a pamphlet titled Negro Songs. And in the description of this pamphlet, he talks about um, with whimsy, um, the era of enslavement. So um, that's his personal background. He then went on to study at Wofford College, came back to Asheville and uh, read for the bar. He became one of the most important and influential civic attorneys in um, the Southeast, really. He argued hundreds of cases before the North Carolina Supreme Court, um, lots of civil cases in superior and like local courts as well. Um, but around 1905, sort of at the peak of his career, really, Sondley decided to kind of go into semi-retirement and turn to history. So um, in 1905, Sondley begins amassing a, an enormous, I mean, kind of unfathomably large collection of books and pamphlets and what he describes in his will as bric-a-brac, um, but that includes art and artifacts, including Native American arrowheads and beads, um, numerous gemstones that are on display at the Science Museum, um, lots of bird's nests and eggs that are now in the hands of the Nature Center, and um, about 30 firearms, antique firearms. Um, so Sondley would allow people into his library. It was a very kind of hot and, and posh tourist destination. Um, it was very fancy to be able to go back to wherever you came from and say, I visited Mr. Sondley's library. And by the time of his death in a, uh, 1930, he had amassed more than 30,000 books. And um, I mean, it's hundreds of gemstones, uh, you know, dozens of pieces of, of art, um, particularly Oriental art. Um, and he willed all of that to the city of Asheville. He had no heirs. Um, he never was married. Um, so in 1931, all of those possessions went to the city of Asheville and were stored in City Hall until 1945, uh, or 43 rather, when they were moved to Pack Memorial Library. Um, so this collection is known to a lot of folks who grew up here as the Sondley Reference Library. And the Sondley Reference Library, as stipulated in um, Mr. Sondley's will, must be set apart from the regular reference library. It must be labeled the Sondley Reference Library. And in the original will, he stated that the library would be restricted to use by white persons of upstanding character. So that being in a will legally bound the library to oblige by his request um, and prevented the in earlier integration of the Asheville Buncombe Library System. Um, the will was often used, the will and also um, I guess you would call it a title on this, the library property where the art museum is today was uh, racially restricted. So while there were multiple attempts, even as early as the 1930s to integrate the library system, um, at the Asheville Buncombe Library System, because of the Sondley will and citing the Sondley will, did not absorb the um, Eagle Market Street branch of the library, which was known as the Colored Library. Um, until 1951. And despite repeated requests for um, African American children, especially to receive library cards and to be able to use the resources in the Sondley Library for schoolwork, the library was not integrated until 1961. And it was um, due to pressure from uh, the group known as ASCOR, the Asheville Student Committee on Racial Equality. And um, Sondley's legacy is really complicated. The materials in the Sondley Library are really complicated. Um, 
it's one of the toughest parts of my job is to deal with the Sonley collection because of its size, um, but also because of the types of material that are in this collection. Um, so with some of that is, and you can find this in the document, um, you can really gather Sondley's interest by looking at the collection, right? He's gonna collect what he's most interested in. So there's a huge amount of um, what we lovingly call ologies. He was really into geology and hydrology um, in biology um, and was a member of the Mount Mitchell um, Association for Arts and Sciences, which is now the, um, the Elisha Mitchell Audubon group here in town. Um, some of his books included all of the first editions of Thomas E. Dixon Jr.'s novels. Um, you probably know him best as the author of A Birth of a Nation. Uh, Dixon wrote three novels um, while he had a residence in Asheville, and those novels are The Klansman, The Leopard Spots, and I forget what the last one is called, um, but those three novels came together and became eventually the movie script for A Birth of a Nation. Um, Dixon was also a member of the Mount Mitchell Society for Arts and Sciences, and so it's definitely not a stretch to think that they were friends. Um, especially considering one of the things we have in our collection is uh, the original handwritten and pencil draft manuscript of The Leopard Spots, which was Dixon's first novel. So Sondley got his hands on that somehow. Um, he also has a lot of books on um, scientific racism and eugenics. He was usually very good to his books, as in you know, taking very good care of them, not writing in them. But in a lot of his eugenics books, you'll find phrases and sentences underlined. So all of these things put together give us a hint at what Sondley's feelings about race uh, were. Now, Sondley was never, um, it, at least looking at newspapers, he wasn't ever vocally in public racist. Um, I've been digging through court cases this collection is so large and requires a lot of skill that um, my predecessors did not have. And, and so I'm just now really getting into some of his personal effects, his letters and you know, other papers. Um, so well, there's still a lot more to try to find out about Sonley's um, public position on race. Uh, but it is definitely not a stretch for me to believe that that was that what his opinions were. It's not hard to come to the conclusion that Sondley was a white supremacist. Um, so one of the reasons, my guess, is that Sondley Award is named after Sondley is because he has he was responsible for writing the history of Buncombe County. Um, it's just called A History of Buncombe County in two volumes. And um, he also wrote hundreds of other works. Uh, most of them are quite small. They were sort of like um, Asheville history articles for the newspaper. Um, he also collected a lot of what we would call today oral histories um, with older folks around him. And so you have a lot of his scribbled notes from folks who were, you know, 30 or 40, 50 years older than he. Um, but <laughs> as, a, as a trained historian, I'm going to tell you what really irks me about Sondley is that despite the fact that he was a very, very well-read person. Um, you know, he had a 30,000 volume library. He, his writing about Buncombe County's history includes almost zero analysis, almost nothing. And, and of course, it wasn't necessarily common in that time to cite things. None of it's really cited. Um, and it lacks objectivity altogether. Um, when you read through a history of Buncombe County with a lens to reading it as like a real history of Buncombe County, you see that there's huge gaps and omissions that we're focusing on the same four or five families um, for long stretches of time. And you sort of leave wondering, okay, well, what about, you know, all, all kinds of different things. Um, he was really all about this, um, this idea of manifest destiny and the great march toward um, human progress. So 
I'll quit rambling about Sonley um, because I'll do a much better job of just answering questions that you might have about him and his life, um, the collection, and what we really know about him as a person. Thanks, Catherine. Any of Sadley's oral histories um, have as their um, speakers, their subjects, the people telling us what they had to tell us, uh, people who weren't white? No. With the exception of his pamphlet I mentioned um, earlier called Negro Songs. Um, and this has actually turned out to be one of the most important pieces in the entire collection. Folks like uh, James Keith and Phil Jamison at Warren Wilson College are folklorists and musicologists, and um, it's helped them a lot, a great deal. Um, it's essentially, he says in his introduction, songs he remembers hearing sung on, on his grandmother's plantation. But yeah, other than that, um, the folks that he does oral histories with, it's it's not exactly right to call them that, but that's kind of what they are. Um, they were, you know, Civil War generals, important local attorneys, um, other wealthy gentlemen. In fact, he, the only woman he ever wrote about was his mother. He wrote a three volume uh, biography of his mother. <laughs> Do we have any documentation from 1988 that we can look at when this award was created? Um, that's a great question, and I I want to try to tap Mr. Komen as a potential resource on that. But also, I am admittedly sometimes at a um, challenge lately because I'm not in my office very often, like maybe once a month. And we have all kinds of random old files. And so I'll be up there next week and go make a note to myself to see if I can dig through to see if we have like, you know, anything in our files that kind of might help us understand. But my guess is like what Catherine pointed out that it's, it's he, you know, then was an obvious choice, I think, because he's kind of known as like this grandfather of Buncombe County history, if you will, you know, and so that's it. it I, my guess is that it's pretty straightforward, but um, but I'll see if I can unearth anything that might be helpful for the to add to the discussion. But um, Mr. Common, I don't do you were you working with Buncombe County when uh, the Sandley Award was first initiated? I can't remember when you started with the county. Yes, I started with the county in 1979, and I also wrote the historic property nomination for the Sondley property. Okay. I would point out that his views toward race <clears throat> were probably tainted at a very, very early age when the 101st Ohio came into Buncombe County in April of 1865. They stopped at the Montreal estate to steal food and whatever else they possibly could. They took Foster Sondley's Shetland pony, and Foster Sondley was just a boy at the time, but when the Union troops were coming down the Buncombe Turnpike into Asheville, they found that the Shetland pony could not keep up so they shot it to death in the middle of the road and Foster Sondley found it there later that day. I don't recall any particular attributes of Foster Sondley that were considered in the naming of this award other than the fact that he was very important in writing an early history of the county. Yeah, Jim. Um I'm glad you brought that up because one of our recent discoveries in, in reprocessing the Sondley collection is that poor pony's shoe. 
Yes, I understand that he did have a good collection of Confederate artifacts, uh, numerous weapons that were involved in the Civil War. He collected Confederate battle flags and, in fact, had a battle flag hanging over his bed until the day he died. Yeah, we have um, our Civil War collection. I, there was never a, an entire audit of the Sonley collection. Um, lots of it actually went missing when it moved from City Hall to um, Pack Memorial Library in 1943. Um, in particular, his uh, collection of lewd images. Um, and um, so anyway, no one really knows the scope of the collection, but our Civil War collection um, is mostly money and battle flags and other types of memorabilia that I think are part of the original Sondland collection. Um, what makes it really hard it, beyond not having a, a full audit of the collection is that in 1987, a huge portion of the collection was sold to Chapel Hill Rare Books. Um, to the tune of about $375,000. And um, that fund is now set up as a trust for special collections. Um, but one of the things that I mentioned in the document that I think folks should really think about is um, lost cause ideology and uh, Sondley's attachment to that. Um, it was Sondley's belief, and we can see this in most of his historical writings that, um, you know, the South was fighting for a very worthy cause during the Civil War, and that, um, you know, puts a, a, a very heroic and romantic spin on the Old South. Um, he likes to use that term a lot, the Old South, the Old South, um, or antebellum. It's also, I think, worth noting that he never actually used the term the Civil War and granted, that term didn't really come into use until the 20th century um, when folks were a little more removed from it. But he often used, um, you know, the rebellion, our rebellion. Um, so that's worth thinking about as well. It was typically referred to in his time as the War of Northern Aggression and Southern Rebellion. And that was a typical way that people in the area did feel after the Civil War. They were certainly not eager to announce that they had been humiliated and defeated. Well, I'll, I'll just say that to the extent that we're considering changing the name of the award, um, I think that we should be as inclusive as possible. And to the extent that a potential recipient in you know basically our lifetimes were uh, is considering turning down an award given by a unit of local government, we should really, really reflect on that. I agree, and thanks for making that statement, Ben. Um, I, in some ways, and I'm interested to hear what all of you think, but um, if, if it's the same in any, you know, it seems the same to me as the Vance Monument or any Confederate monument where even if it evokes the feeling that of not being inclusive or, you know, remotely <laughs> um, in, in, in a, a racist uh, way I, and, or harmful way to anyone, I think we should think, think really hard about um, about renaming, or as you said, reflecting. I think that's a great way to put it. So. It was awkward when I talked to Andrea um, about this. She was, um, um, a, it made me feel terrible because I had no idea. And to um, put her in the position of, of that, um, that's why this <clears throat> sort of came up. Um, so I, I agree with what Ben was saying about um, uh, it doesn't sh uh, shed a good light on the city, um, in my opinion. Um, 
Yeah, and just really quickly, I, I will say that part of what we're doing over at Special Collections is a, in some ways, a rediscovery of Sondly and a rediscovery of like what our roots are as a special collection and using that um, analysis and, and reprocessing of that collection to think about where we're going to head in the future um, and what our, you know, our solid foundation is. And as part of the redesign of our space, we're including, um, despite the fact that the, the primary idea is to center the voices of Black folks and women in our new design, we're still including Sondly, first of all, because we're legally obligated to mark off a section of the library as the Sondly reference library. Um, but also to give folks an idea of Sondly as a person and Sondly as a contributor to local history and why archives are important because we're able to go back and really look at all of Sondly's papers and say, okay, here's where, what his thinking was. Here's where he got this information. And how do we as researchers today do that differently? So in some ways, he's this really amazing case study for what history was like and how history was done, um, especially by, by lay people in the 19, you know, 20s and 30s. Um, so there are lots of, you know, wonderful benefits to Sondly's collection still being around. Um, and of course, like I said, the history of Buncombe County, uh, we refer to it in special collections as the Bible. Um, if folks come to me and they have a, um, you know, like a general Buncombe County history question that none of my staff can answer necessarily quickly, um, we sit down three things in front of that person. One is uh, John Preston Arthur's A History of Western North Carolina. The next one is Ora Blackman's A History of Western North Carolina. And then the third is A History of Buncombe County, um, because those three are sort of our trifecta of uh, general knowledge of Buncombe County. So, um, you know, it's, he's definitely, he definitely contributed to writing the history of Asheville. Um, but, you know, like some of you have said, if it makes one person uncomfortable, you know, why, why continue to do something that way? And, and that's a big part of what we're doing at Special Collections is saying, you know, if it makes high school students uncomfortable to, you know, the first thing they see when they walk in a room is a giant painting of Thomas Wolfe staring down at them, then let's think about how we can integrate these things in a way that feels more comfortable to everybody and just makes history more accessible. Well, I think you mentioned um, to me in a previous conversation that in general, the city of Asheville is moving away from naming awards and other recognitions um, on historical folks kind of as a, as a uh, precedent sort of moving forward. And I think that is worth noting. I would agree that um, that there's not a particularly compelling reason for me to continue to make people uncomfortable in awarding <laughs> something which we're intending to be an honor. And if it's not received that way, then um, then I think there's there's not a real compelling reason to keep the name the way that it is. I do think there is um, what I think frustrates me sometimes about this particular conversation and the response that we have to immediately change the name of something is a missed opportunity around education. And um, history is gonna be uncomfortable. And I think what's valuable about Sondley's collection is the depth to which we have those resources now. And that we can't just dismiss what, ha what happened. And there is an opportunity for HRC to, and the city to um, take a position that is um, a, a change moving forward and an opportunity to have a narrative around that that is educational. And I think that there, um, to, to miss that opportunity and just change the name would be, I think, unfortunate because we do want to um, learn from what that was and talk about it and get in the midst of it as a, as a community and grow out of that in a positive and productive way. 
And so I think there it goes maybe beyond in some ways as a community, just the changing of the name of the award, which I think is um, only one part of the conversation. Um, and that without Sonley's collection, you know, we have a, a unique opportunity maybe in this community to have a deeper conversation because of the depth of the information that Sonley's collection provides us about that whole era of, um, of history and in particular in this area and this community. I agree, but let's not forget that it was a distinctly one-sided, narrow, you know, exclusive point of view as well. So it's not the entire history. It is one small segment of one small limited portion of the society at the time. Yeah. I, I was just trying to brainstorm a little bit on what you're saying, Emily. I wonder if we could, I mean, and this, this maybe isn't what we want to do, just like maybe, the, maybe this one thing, like it's just a step and then we kind of have some bigger effort, but we could, you know, if we, if you all do decide to um, rename the award, then we can write a dialogue that's published as a press release by our communications department um, that would be posted on our social media and stuff so that we can kind of fully flesh out like the acknowledgement of, you know, what we're moving on from and why and you know kind of just make a really thoughtful um educational piece to, to publish if you will i agree with that i think us more than some of the other um groups and commissions and uh, you know we are tasked with history um that is what this body does and i think that it is important um to not um what do i want to say uh we as a community are moving forward and uh that isn't to say we should cover up or dismiss or um, ignore history because this body in particular is doing a lot to protect history in a lot of ways and certainly that's around the buildings and, and landmarks but with those landmarks come similar historical roots that that are there and we as a community can grow from that and learn from that and tell other sides of the story that were omitted from way back as moving forward. But, um, but I, I think as this body preserving some level of history and taking it for what it's worth and layering onto that what we know now that we didn't know 100 years ago, 200 years ago is important. And Alex, I have a sort of a technical question. I seem to recall that the Somli Award itself was, you know, we discussed it in our uh, normal meetings in the past, and then that it was awarded at a Preservation Society event. Is that correct? Yeah, and I'm not really sure when that began, but they've always been kind enough to let us kind of ride their coattails a little bit because they always have um, their annual awards event, award event, um, the Griffin Awards. And so it's, you know, a great way to kind of gather a lot of people to network and to like have a more celebrational feel for the person who's getting the Somni Award. Otherwise, it's kind of like they <laughs> come to one of our meetings and it's a little more somber than going to a big um, fun party. So I think that is, you know, why we've done it in the past. Unfortunately, because of the pandemic this year, um, the Preservation Society did help us a ton, and Will worked on a cool video um, for a with Andrea that was published on their social media. Um, and but and and so, if you guys have any thoughts on that, you know, it, for the future, obviously we are certainly open. We can really kind of do whatever we want. You know, there aren't any rules around the Sonley Award, or you know you all can you know brainstorm and offer your thoughts if you want to make any tweaks to how the award is given or whether we should even get a new right now it's a silver bowl that's engraved and it's we had to put a base on it and so we could add more signatures because we ran out of space so even if we want to talk about getting a new actual award i know that's not what, really what we're here to accomplish today but i'm just throwing all these things out there just to say you know the door's open to to any and all thoughts so yeah, and I guess the distinction I'm trying to draw is that this is a 
unit of local government that we're talking about from that lens. And I think many of you are aware I'm also involved with Preservation Society and private charities have their own um, things that they can and uh, want to do. And I, I would strongly re remind everyone that we're looking at this as a unit of the government and what does the government want to uphold and, and, and uplift. Um, I'd like to bring back an idea. Oh, sorry. Um, just to bring back an idea that I think was mentioned briefly, that it may be better to, when selecting a new name, move away from any his historic figures, just because, you know, we are located in the South and any old figure is probably going to have certain ideals. So, um, yeah, maybe something like, you know, to do with the commission's annual award or, you know, general, general name. And sorry for interrupting you, Emily. It's hard to tell like who's going to talk and when. Um, I was just going to say, you know, something that I see as a bigger problem throughout humanities organizations in Buncombe County is that we don't talk to each other. Um, you know, granted, I just took my position in January and only had like two months of real work. But like, I've, I've never met any of you folks. <laughs> um, and so like, besides Alex, I've met Alex before, but it, it seems kind of odd that you're out there and you're working on this stuff. And there are folks at the Swannanoa Valley Museum and there are folks at the Preservation Society and at, at Wincha, at Western North Carolina Historical Association. And it, like there is some communication, but it's very informal. And it feels like sometimes in special collections, we're like, oh, surprised by something that's going on um, that maybe y'all are doing or Advanced Birthplace or any number of these places. And um, I know that your role is more as a ju semi quasi judicial body and dealing more with you know actual buildings. Um, but I think it's really important that we all talk to one another and know what's going on. And so I just wanna offer special collections as another government body to partner with on this kind of stuff. You know, don't forget that we're part of Buncombe County's um, general system. So, you know, we're really, and, and we're trying to find new traditions too. So if you wanted to, you know, think about working together on this only award or whatever it becomes, that's certainly something we would be interested in. Thanks, Catherine. That's awesome. I do, I always, I think we all wish that we had better ways to network on a variety of topics and maybe something we could kind of all put our heads together when we're not in this crazy time is trying to have some kind of annual forum or something where we gather professionals that work in all these different organizations in our in Buncombe County so that we can all kind of try to better stay in the loop and help each other help support each other um, in in because I'm sure that there are a million different ways we, we could, you know, help each other accomplish different goals. So if we just knew what was going on. <laughs> and same within the historic districts too, to lump them in um, on that too. When you were talking about launching the new name or leaving the name, whatever we all decide, which seems like we're leaning on, maybe if it were at a county commission or a city council meeting as well, that it, um, that it allows uh, both of those uh, governments to understand the importance of, and how uh, HRC is looking at um, a larger picture as well. I know there's funding issues that we that maybe that can help um, as to um, help with y'all's budget, uh, Alex. Um, that's it. Yeah, one other thing I'd put out there is um, for those folks who have gotten this award in the past, some perhaps there's some sort of outreach that needs to take place with them and see, you know, if they have any input about how they'd like to have it styled going forward. I, I don't know that it's going to be a huge deal to any of them, but someone may have an opinion. I believe Mr. Cohen was given the award I, I saw on the list. So. Jim, do you have any thoughts you can offer um, as a previous recipient? 
No, not really. It is a, a very difficult question to ask. And I know that the Preservation Society has struggled in the past with the issue of how to communicate with the Historic Resources Commission and other groups within Buncombe County. There's no easy answer to that. Well, I can say from my point, I have, and <laughs> and those on the subcommittee that are here can say, although I think our subcommittee members have dwindled since pandemic started and people started resigning, uh, that we did, and one of my goals is to work more closely with the Preservation Society. Um, that was something I, I made as a goal starting at the beginning of the year and we did get some traction on we're partnering with them on some events but then unfortunately the pandemic struck and derailed all of those um really great the great momentum we had going so you know that's still uh, on our radar when we can start reconvening with the subcommittee again we haven't been given the okay from the city manager's office to have any subcommittee meetings um and that's partly because of open meetings law and all of those things that we have to navigate. It's really kind of impossible for us to do more meetings than what we're already doing um, as far as public meetings. So that's why we're not convening just as an, uh, as an aside an update on that. But certainly that is, um, you know, something that we are striving to relationship we're trying to build upon and we'll continue to do that as we move forward and hopefully out of the out of this crazy time, eventually we can start trying to partner on more more things with them and, and any other groups that we can try to connect with. Alex, when is the next award given? So in, in essence, we have a deadline that we need to work against. Um, it is given, let me see. This is May. like one of those things, May, is that, okay. Yeah, Thanks, I think that's the Griffin Award, the Preservation Month is May. And it's towards the end of May that I don't think it's on the calendar. We usually start talking about it in, in like March, I think, and trying to get y'all's brains moving on potential nominees and then make a vote by the very latest, the, the May meeting, so that as Will pointed out, could go to the be awarded at the Griffin. I know we, we we voted in April because we have to get the cup engraved. So we have to build time in for that. So that's the that's the month I think we always usually ask for a vote for that. So we've got some time, you know, to consider this. And I, I think we have, I don't know what, I, who knows what the beginning of the year will look like agenda wise. I think July is going to be a pretty big agenda. That doesn't mean I don't think we should include it, but um, we can just, you know, go away today and think about this and, and then come back at, at a later meeting and share more thoughts and go from there, um, if that's okay with you. And I can confer with Emily on, you know, the next agenda to see what how much time we think we'll need to build in for this discussion in addition to what else we have, so... Do y'all have other thoughts or questions? Some of you have been very quiet, <laughs> but I understand that also we have a lot of new folks too, that this is a new, a totally entirely new topic for, so no pressure, but just wanna make sure everybody has an opportunity to say anything that they want. So what's the, the status of um, Andrea's award? Is that all? a done deal and cups engraved and she accepted and all of that is um i guess i was just maybe wondering if we needed to do that sort of retroactively <laughs> to 2020 if we get to there or if moving forward with 2021 is is appropriate i think it would be great to retroactively change the award for her And um, yeah, it's in her house now. Some I keep thinking she's going to use it for her dog, but she's not. Um, 
<laughs> and but um yeah uh, and i was thinking it would be nice if it was something that uh changed that that they kept but I, it was really nice she sat there and read the award she kept <laughs> she, she she was just saying the, uh, well anyway she um she laughed at some of the names on there uh, but but it was some um she, she's funny um I don't want to be quoted. Um, anyway, uh, I was thinking it would be nice if it was something that each person kept each year, but it, but then I was uh, contradicting myself by it was nice w w for her just reading the names on there and her being a part of that group. I thought was uh, was nice to see when when she did get the award. Um, but it, usually it is at that uh, Griffin Award, so it's a big a bigger to do than. Uh, some clown showing up in her yard with a beer um so that's how it went this year um, so. is is janice online i'm here janice, do you see any problems with us doing something retroactively like renaming it an award or anything like that i can't think of any specific legal reason um you've named you've named the the award in the, the past i you know there are sometimes we have resolutions about things that change something um uh, i'm not sure how we would do that if she's been issued this I'm, I'm almost i'm thinking about the cup you know maybe it would be interesting in the history of it when it gets renamed to retitle it like uh, that line have a new title and say going forward and then somehow there's a write-up of the history of the last recipient really made us think about this and as a result you know as part of the history that as as emily was saying when, when it if we if the name is decided to be changed or just go on into a neutral name that's all part of why it was done so um yeah i guess i envision it saying something like you know, if this is, if we all agree upon it or whatever the majority of the rule is there in the year blah blah blah, the name of this award was changed. Please see resolution twenty one dash oh one dash eleven or whatever that resolution is, and so that it, that it can be done justice and the underlying reason be there. And then what is done in the past is done in the past. That we I don't know that we should go and you know tell every person who's gotten it in the past that. Uh, they must call it the Somley Award, but that's what it was called at the time it was awarded. And going forward, they're allowed to call it either A or B. Well, I wonder if um, if we could, I mean, it's something to consider maybe retiring the cup and creating something new. And um, whenever the, um, either went, either or both, whenever the award is given, we like have make a statement to that effect and include some kind of like letter that goes along with the award to kind of provide some context. And, um, and I see Valeria just raised her hand. So I'm gonna let her talk because she hasn't said anything yet today. <laughs> well, I, I just, I talked to Andrea afterwards and I know she was she was quite upset, and she told me she did give someone a talking to. I don't know who it was. So I think some acknowledgement of the reason these things are changing is because of her would would be felt, you know, uh, deeply felt by her. Um, I think the collection is valuable because it's it's history, but I think we can also, we have the opportunity to change the name and be more inclusive and not name it after old dead people. So you know, that's just the way I feel. Yeah, I had like a 25, 30 minute phone conversation with Andrea, I guess right after you left her house, Will, she said, <laughs> and she described the talking to and um, all of it. Yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> but, you know, she said, I just want you to know that a black woman's got Sonley's bowl. And it was great. It, it made me very happy. 
Um, so, I, but I think, yeah, acknowledging Andrea somehow in this process was, is, is really important. Well, before we adjourn, I would just like to say Merry Christmas and Happy Hanukkah, or Happy Kwanzaa to everyone, and wish you the best of New Year's. Thanks, everybody. Do you does anybody else want to have further discussion on on this item, or do y'all are you good for now? We can kind of think on it and come back at the next meeting or the meeting after that, whatever makes sense. Yeah, I so think we should then, sleep on it and come back to it in January or February. Okay. And when we come back to it, we're coming back with suggestions for a new name? I think so. If that would be helpful, you know, while we're thinking on it, be thinking about all of the ideas that we talked about today, like a new, um, uh, a new, you know, entirely new award or, you know, what all the things that we've talked about. Um, so just be considering that. I mean, and for those who have never seen the Sonley Award, it's a silver cup that's about this, like diameter about this, and it's sitting on a wooden base. So, um, so just, you know, be thinking about that part too, like the tangible. Um, and a huge thank you to Catherine. We're really grateful for your expertise and offering to help us with this. It's, you're you're wonderful. We've, I, any chance I have an opportunity to send people your way, I'm like, go to the library. They're the most wonderful people. We so. love it. And we love when people come and see us. And I put my email address in the chat. Um, but if folks have questions for me, you can certainly reach me and I'll let Alex email you my email address just so you'll have it and I won't sit here and spell out my name or anything. Um, but yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have as you're thinking about this process, um, either to help you answer questions about Sonley personally, if you're trying to come to a, a decision on that, or if you're thinking about creative new names for the award that might may or may not be other people. So. Um, you know, give me give me a call, send me an email. I will be happy to to help. A motion to adjourn. Second. We'll see y'all next next month. Yep. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Happy holidays. Bye. Yeah, Happy holidays, everyone. Bye, Bye. 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 everyone. Bye.